Um, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Yeah. But the music you're playing, yeah. Toys in every store. Don't like it. I don't. I beyond <laughs> beyond. No. What are they, What is it? Anyways, um, I don't actually like Christmas music. I don't dislike it, but I would never put it on. Except the kids have been asking me to put it on. Oh, it's so the kids asking. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I'm, I'm. I'm well, they're like, all happy about Christmas. So. Yeah, you know, Christmas. Yeah. Wearing Santa hats and. Yeah. That's cool. They're kids. You don't like Christmas, eh? I don't celebrate stuff. Yeah, I know, but like, why don't you like it? Like, what's wrong with it? What is it? Is it just too? Is it too much? Is that the thing? Is it like the too much part that bugs you? Probably. I don't. Know. Yeah. I haven't thought about it that. I don't day. like birthday parties. I don't like celebrations. I, that's just my thing. Just leave me alone. <laughs> yeah, but like, you, but, but for you, you personally, yeah, yeah, but for you personally, like, just if a, just you don't like it, yeah, it's just a day. But is it because like I don't want the food? Is there a particular reason? Like, do you have gets in my way. Yeah, it just it disrupts the routine. Is that the main? gets in my way? Like, so it hasn't even started yet, and it was somewhere the other day. I'm trying to think where it was, and oh, uh, yeah, Christine's friend had uh, had us over. So there you go. Yeah. And it was just a table full of food. And I know me. Right. So I'm in the, an environment where... The environment. Yeah, it it's is. my environment now. Yeah. So I'm going to have a couple beers. Fine. I was I was good with that. Had a, had a few. And, um, and there's a table full of food. Like just stuff that I wouldn't eat. Right. Right? So then I, I, if it's there, I eat it. It's just... It sits there, you can sit there and tell me don't eat it. It's like, yeah, mm. you can, I can also tell you to... Shut up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my nature. So I eat I it. So it's there. Well, then it's late night. Then it's a late night. Yeah, and right. then it's the next day into the next day. And it's people. Like I'm not. I know that you know that I can. I get along with people. But I don't like being around people. I like quiet. I like being by myself. Yep. I like thinking by myself. So like now when, when you're in the holidays, you're always around people. Yeah. Let's exhausting. play a game. It's exhausting. I don't want to. Yeah. Or I do. I get it. I get it. Yeah, yeah, that's my thing. So that's yeah. that's what it is. I can turn on the group participation when needed. Yeah, I know you can. But um, I do prefer the alone time. Yeah. I must say. Yeah. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by the PowerTech Online Membership Program. If you've been listening to Andy and I wondering, hey, how are they able to get all this podcast content out there? Well, that's because of our members. For just $9.99 a month, you can get access to our online video library, including hundreds of videos of Coach Andy teaching, and have the option for consultation calls with Andy or myself to go over anything you need. We can cover training, nutrition, coaching, parenting, agents, the junior college hockey path, whatever's of interest to you. You'll also be able to participate in our popular Ask Me Anything episodes, have access to special discount codes, and be given priority for any PowerTech in-person camps or events. If you like what we're doing here and you want to support us, this is the best way to do it. Visit powertechhockey.ca slash memberships or find the link in the description of this video to learn more. Um, okay. Do you have anything else you'd like to say? Uh, or do you want to just fire it up? What? What? Do you want to just fire it up? Yeah, let's just, else go. To say? Like, let's yeah, just go. Like, yeah. Okay. Um, so we're doing a Ask Me Anything today. Uh, these are from the members. So I sent out a survey. Survey? Questionnaire, I guess. Put in your question if you want one. And we got some questions. So I picked 14 questions. Strategically, I pick 14. Um, so we'll start. Uh, let's see. First one is from Adam. Adam says, this is likely a difficult question to answer. It may not be appropriate for a show, but here it goes. My son recently broke a bone in his wrist, the scaphoid bone. He specified the bone. Um, it is in a cast for likely seven to eight weeks. He's a U15 AA player. And basically the day after the cast went on, he's asking to be on the ice. His doctor said he can do anything except, of course, he's a goalie and his catching hand is what's injured. In general, how do you approach conditioning uh, during injuries? I've heard everything from don't let him near the ice to find a large glove and put him in the net. This is a very specific example, but even just a general discussion on injuries and playing sports uh, would be useful. Uh, so that's the question. I, yeah. We had a couple of these. So this is, oh, I really? picked, yeah, I picked this one specifically, but there was a few yeah. questions about like playing through injuries, playing yeah. with injuries, et yeah. cetera. So opening thoughts on that one. Yeah. Um, like in general, I don't want to just use his example. I don't, I don't know if using a large glove and that then you got a broken wrist is the way to go or a broken hand, but, uh, 
first thing is you you always can do something, right? So whatever, unless it's like severe, but you could always do something. So if it's an upper body injury, you could always do something with the lower body. If it's a lower body injury, you could do something with your upper body. So it doesn't necessarily mean you're skating, but it could be. Like in his case, he can be on the ice if the doctors and the stuff say it's okay. He can be on the ice. He just can't do his normal stuff. So you can do something. Um, so my answer to that is just work around injuries, right? Well, there's always something you can do. And uh, working around it could be a lot of different things. And it might even be, I, I'm not going to say it's beneficial, more beneficial than playing. But sometimes that little that rest, you can do other things. So, you know, especially if you're deep in a season and you're beaten up a little bit. And maybe that injury allows you to get other things done, such as mobility and conditioning. You can get your conditioning back up. So you can still always do something. Um, you can do yoga. You know, if you can lift, you can lift around that injury. So always something you can do. And then you could also eat right. You know, uh, those are things like, the thing is, is just like a broken hand doesn't mean that, okay, I'm done for six weeks, can't do anything. You can work around it, right? So, uh, and then another thing that I think you could do is um, uh, work your brain a little bit. Visualize, find brain exercises keep yourself in a good mental state keep yourself in um uh maybe maybe working on that specifically you know visualizing and all of all the different things that you can do with that and uh, but anyways the bottom line is you can work around it no problem and uh and the thing is is don't aggravate the injury right Just do your rehab but don't aggravate the injury so like in that case yeah i don't think you you should be stopping pucks with your broken hand yeah. you know i'm not a doctor yeah, maybe yeah. you can yeah but it doesn't make a lot of sense to me yeah so work around it eat right absolutely you can it's uh, that's what i would do yeah but I, I bet i wrote the same thing down i'm a big fan of working around injuries i think a lot of times players i notice that even with some of the junior kids that i work with they think they have an injury or something's nagging them and it's like i gotta mail it in because i have a sore finger it's like okay let's let's do other things so even if guys have a groin or something it's like do a single leg on the other side or like do work around it like don't just pack it in and i think that's an issue because people think injuries are so devastating because of the time off and it's like yeah well, if you eat like shit and sit on the couch for eight weeks and do nothing then yeah you're gonna have some work to do to get back right on the one hand um the only thing i'll add to what you said is you actually need time to heal when you actually when you have a real injury and if you rush to get back, one, you can re-aggravate it. But the other thing we've talked about this before is the mentality of I'm going to be behind. And there's countless examples. Like the one I, I use a lot is uh, Adam Jeffrey, who he plays at RIT now. And he, in his four years of junior, he had both of his Achilles tendons severed, which is like a devast, this is like a six month or well, maybe more. So, and six months till you can start skating and then however long till you get back to it. Uh, he still ended up getting a division one scholarship and moving on to play at a higher level. And this is a guy in his prime years, like his junior years where he's being scouted to go somewhere that's a higher level. He still was fine with that much time off in two separate years. So if your kid's out for six weeks, even if he doesn't do anything, like they'll be okay. They'll come back and they'll get it back. Even if they don't do anything. Um, I don't think it's the best idea to do nothing, but my point of that is hopefully understood. You want to take the time to rest the injury and then do what you can to keep yourself in shape, et cetera, while you're doing that stuff like you pointed out, right? So yeah. that's all I'll add yeah. around that. The thing with that is just don't let one thing stop you from doing the things. Right. That I forget what my sentence was, but <laughs> <laughs> just can't let one thing stop you. Yeah. Uh, next one. Mark, this is a loaded one. Uh, what makes a great hockey organization? Everything from culture, hockey directors, board members, etc. We have a ton of kids uh, in our learn to play organization, and most of them leave to go play at other organizations as they get older. We have say, old, say that last sentence again. Uh, we have a ton of kids, and yeah. so they have a ton of kids in their organization, but most of them leave to go play at other organizations as they get older. So they're yeah. not staying with that organization. Okay. Yeah, I got it. Uh, when or we have an older building. Uh, with that doesn't have all the state of the art off ice amenities like a video room, shooting lanes, etc. Uh, so we need to be better at developing the players um, so that those factors don't matter as much. So um, kids are leaving their organization. What makes a great organization? Go ahead. Oh, well, what makes a good organization um, to me is number one is people. Now, also depends on what level we're talking about. 
So I know that this is, uh, did he say U15? Not really? This guy didn't say it. Last so it's, it's obviously team. youth hockey. Yeah. Youth hockey. But so that, like, what makes a great youth hockey organization and what makes a great junior college program is diff- is going to be different and what makes a pro organization is different because simply the focus is, uh, is going to be a little bit different, right? So um, when you get some sort of pro junior college, your focus is primarily on winning. So that's that's one thing, and when you're on, when you're in the youth, um, in the youth circuit, it's may not be just about winning, and it may be, but it still may be, right? Depending on the organization you're with. So, based on the question that we have here, sounds like it's a small organization that's not, that winning um, isn't like a um, the primary thing because people leave because they go to bigger centers. That's what it sounds like. But anyways, it, it, first of all, to me, it'd be your philosophy on what is important to your organization. And that doesn't mean because you're in a, like let's say you're in a um, organization that it's all about winning, that doesn't make it good or bad. And neither does a, if your primary uh, focus is on development or creating good cultures, that's, that's not good or bad either. It's, it's, it is what it is. But I think it's your philosophy, number one. So if your philosophy is uh, either one of those things, you want to have, my first thing is always good people, right people, right? So if you have good people, and what do I mean by good people? It's like um, people that I think good people are, well, they're there for the kids. Like in youth hockey, they're there for the kids. Well, I would say that in pro junior and stuff, you're developing players too. But you're, you need good people that understand the game, but they're there for the right reasons and, and match the philosophy of the organization. So if you got an organization that wants development, your coach is all about winning, wrong person. Or you look at the organization, they stress development, and then you're losing games um, or you're not as competitive that he would like and he starts losing his shit on you. That's not the right philosophy. So that's that's what I mean by that. And I think if you, if you align your philosophy with your, uh, if your culture with your philosophy, then I think you're in pretty good shape. Right, so that that would be the number one thing. I, I think the level of hockey is huge. Uh, I think you you need to put the players first, and I think any youth hockey program that's very important. I, th- I, I see too many times in youth hockey where people say the players come first, but not really because coaches, uh, some coaches are getting paid or they're looking to move up, and it's about their coaching, not about their the philosophy. So uh, it, it comes from up top. Uh, I think that if you have Good people, but and, and I think it's important that you have people that have played at a decent level that they can impose some hockey, not just life, right? And um, that's that. And then the piece about uh, yeah, and the good people will um, will create the right culture, right? Yeah. And, and who am I to say what your culture should be? Mm-hmm. But I, I have my philosophies on that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just maybe just kind of tighten okay. up what you're saying. Sure. Um, so the first thing for me, when you're talking about good people, that's one thing. Like you want people that are there for the right reasons. What are the right reasons? They're putting the kids first for a youth organization. That's one thing for me. Do they put the kids first? Um, when you're talking about like the directors, board members, et cetera, I think a lot of times what I hear in our area, at least when it comes to board and directors and whatever, from the conversations that we have, it it sounds like the reason they're there is frequently lost so people that join the board maybe they join with good intentions they're there for the kids etc but then over time the goal is kind of masked now because they enjoy being the director to some degree or they like being the power of it or they want to be important or whatever and their own personal reasons get in the way or maybe they're making some money whatever the issue is so now that goal of the kids is kind of secondary I, f- I hear that a ton with like common criticism of boards and this kind of thing um, where there's not really checks on what's going on so you want to make sure that yeah you have people that are there for the right reasons but then even once you have your philosophy i think it's important that the people you hire are also on the same page with the philosophy so and this can be difficult especially youth because you're not a lot of times you can't pay people like a ton of money so even if you pay a little bit how how much are you going to be able to find the best people? Like it's a hard thing. So I'm not saying this is easy to do, but if your philosophy as an organization is X, but the people that you have to take are not in line with X, which you should be screening for before they take the job. But if they're not in line with it, then that can 
can cause a problem down the line. And I think that causes a lot of conflict within organizations is when you're bringing people on that are not aligned with what they're trying to do. And so you should be screening people just like you would in a company. Like if your company mission is this thing and the guy comes in, he's like, oh yeah, I don't believe in that at all. It's like, well, that's not really a good person to hire for your goal. You know, that's exactly so, right. So that's, 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 always, that's what I meant by having good people yeah. too. It's like you implement your coaching staffs, staffs. Yeah. Your yeah. coaching, your coaches, you implement the people that align with the philosophy and you're going to be wrong sometimes for sure. But you know, another, another step to make a good organization and it sounds good in theory and I'm not sure how, how good this actually is. Like when people implement it, but if you're in a center where um, you have ex pros or people that have played at a high level or people that have coached at a high level or someone, it doesn't even have to play at a high level, but if coached, like, let's say uh, a local organization for years and years and they've, they're good coaches. They've taken uh, courses, all that kind of stuff. Like I think a good idea is to have a co- coaching mentorship program so that, and it's not, it's not like I, I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to say this the wrong way, but like if I was coaching, like, let's say in this area, um, the Windsor, Windsor area, the AAA level, it's not like I would need a mentor to coach, but several guys would. Right. So like maybe for me, it would be like, okay, I, I already get it, but, a good thing would be to just stay on the same program. It's, it's still good. Like, and you can still extract things from people. So I think a lot of coaches, you know, the, it, you get the right guy with the philosophy. I think a lot of coaches just get overwhelmed sometime or just run out of ideas or get bored, or gets bored or get stagnant. So having a mentor in that, um, it, within the board, like say, no, here's ideas for your, or maybe it's the same system all the way through, right? More or less. Uh, but something that you could follow and bounce ideas off and um, have coaches work with other teams and stuff like that just to see different philosophies. But yeah, I think my, that goes right into my, the next thing I wrote was about oh, the really? com- communication factor, because even now within an organization, let's say you have the good people and all this, if every team acts like its own entity and there's no intercommunication on like trying to keep everything together on the same page, then that can cause an issue because now it's like, okay, this coach started doing this thing over here. That coach started doing that thing over there. And now they're kind of going this way. So now the players that are on this team are used to this. And next year when they're supposed to have that coach, well, now they don't like that coach. And these things can start to happen because we're not communicating. We're not, the coaches aren't talking to each other. The leaders of the organization are not talking to each other. And everyone's just kind of going about their life because for most of these things, it's going to be either a volunteer position or you're spending your extra time and you're not totally invested in it because you have other life things going on. So trying to keep a grip on that is important. Keeping that intercommunication up and down the chain is important. Yeah, I, I, an organization that's done a very good job with that, from what I hear, is the St. Louis um, Junior Blues. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, but what makes you say that? That seems like a weird example. I like, know. Why, why like do you know that? Because yeah. I've been around the block. Yeah, man. I know. I was going to say, well, how, do, how, do you, how do you know that information? Okay, well, this is – this. no, I'm glad you asked that because when I coached in Detroit, so – I, uh, with my 97 age group, that would have been against, uh, Keith Kachuk and uh, Cunning and all those guys, uh, Keith coached that team and we played them like three times. And, uh, I've had conversations with him particularly, and not that he would remember that necessarily because, but he might, he might. But, uh, so I, we had Ryan Moore and Brendan Warren and those guys. Um, but I had conversations with him and he, he was talking about like we just we don't have the kids they don't have that culture of hockey which i I didn't agree with necessarily but i let him talk about it because but from his vantage point uh detroit i I always think of canada but detroit in the canadian cities you're that's hockey 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 so i think in that st louis market it was it's not the biggest excuse me hockey center like population but it's not bad this is pretty good and that you extract guys from all over but in the in, in the mid Midwest, not not everyone plays hockey, right? So you're tr- you're trying to get people, but it, nonetheless, you get there were some very good players there. But what I don't know if I heard this from him, but I know that Jeff Brown, who I played junior with a little bit uh, in Sudbury, um, he his kids Logan and whoever the other ones are played in that system. And but anyways, it's an NHL city where guys love to be, so there's a lot of ex NHLers there. Who have kids who play hockey 
So now all of a sudden you got a whole bunch of NHL guys who kids are in the hockey organization. And all of a sudden you got, and maybe it's Al McInnes working on power plays or shooting with all the teams. Oh, or really? Jeff, that, is that yeah, how yeah. they do it? They like yeah. work up and down. Yeah. The well, this is what, block? this is what I was told. Okay. I don't know a hundred percent, but yeah, you got yeah, NHL yeah. coaches there, Hitchcock's around, like you got all these people around to help the youth organization. So like, if you're in an organization, you have Al McKinnis working on helping guys with power plays, and it could be Keith Kachuk coaching and go to that resource and yeah, say, you know, what thing. are you doing your power? Yeah. So, anyways, I know Jeff Brown was working in that system, and he had a couple teams that he was playing, and Kachuk was there, and then there's several different guys in uh, ex NHLers that are involved in that system, so you can bounce things off each other, and it's like. You know, if we're buddies, especially, or if you have two kids and I have two kids and we've got maybe three, four different divisions, do you want to help out this team on this day, this day? And you start start getting real good people coming in, and then that's another way to attack it. So what they've done with that youth program is phenomenal. Were they, phenomenal. They were they're really, team. really good. play like they were a good team. Yeah, great team. Yeah, cool. Yeah, we won. Well, we won both. Yeah, 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 yeah. You guys are the best. <laughs> um, the, so last, just to beat that one to death, last thing I was going to say is, it's good to have people that have expertise, but you also want to have people that have a knack for teaching and care to teach. Because I remember a mistake that was made a couple times when I was in youth hockey is we did hire someone that played. So uh, they weren't NHLers, but we had like XOHL guys who you would expect, but they were horrible coaches. And so there's there's a expertise is good, but you do want to check that there's an, they have a knack for teaching or they can actually communicate a message to the players. That's an important piece because sometimes you have like a less experienced guy or someone who didn't really play, but they just care and they make up for it with the fact that they teach or the good X's and O's guys or, or, or whatever. Right. Well, just going along with that, we're going to beat this horse again, but I think it's important. I think one of the lessons you can learn in here. So if you just go use that St. Louis junior blues example is that uh, people were helping each other. That's a pretty good thing. But in order to get to get help, you have to be humble. You have to accept that, like Keith Kachuk has to accept that maybe Jeff Brown knows something more than him about a certain yeah, thing. Yeah, maybe they know something you don't. Do you know, see right? what I mean? Yeah. And 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 that's a thing that I find in youth hockey, where, um, because it's it might be an insecurity that a that a coach already knows, but they want to know what you're thinking, but they don't want to say, yeah, please help me. Let, I want to learn about that and pick your brain to death. So that's a downfall, right? So you got to be willing to to accept the help. You got number two. You got to be willing to be humble enough to realize that you probably don't know anything. And one of the guys that I coached with, actually, got a hold of me yesterday. To be honest with you, it was Pat Peak. So Pat, uh, do you know Pat Peak's story? Just from you talking about, yeah, him. yeah, he was a he, excellent coach, excellent coach. He coaches in the Detroit system, but he came to me and asked me if he could coach with me in the one year, and I said, yeah, like I'd love for you to coach with me. He was uh, the first overall in the OHL. He was. Uh, CHL player of the year. He played in Washington as a first round pick. And he's, uh, he's uh, the player. I don't know if you're familiar with that, that he got tripped going for an icing and he broke both his shattered, oh, both really? his heels. Yeah. So it yeah. was a career ender. He came That's, back. I do know him. Yeah. But, but anyways, Pat is like, he's a brilliant coach. And when he coached with me, he, if, if I was too proud or not humble enough to learn some of the things that he's excellent at. Like, so for me, my philosophy, not my philosophy, but what, what I like in hockey is doing things fast, you know, and I feel like a lot of, a lot of times skill, if you, if you do your drills and practices in, in a setting that resembles a game and fast and with pace and, you know, all the details in there, I feel that a lot of it translates. Pat's practices when he would take over things were like completely opposite of mine. Is that bad? No, because a lot of people say, oh, you stand around too much. It's like, okay, but he's teaching you so many things. So like his D zone, his power play, his PK, it was like he would he would just sit there and break it down, break it down. And yeah, I could see sometimes kids would be like, okay, but like if if you got to be smart enough to listen, this guy's a, this guy's an excellent coach, excellent hockey player. He knows his stuff. So anyways, my point to that is that I was the head coach and you could get – um you can get butt hurt if someone steals your thunder, but you can't let people steal your thunder because again, a rising tide raises all ships. As they say. <laughs> As but they but say. Pat, so Pat made me a better coach in many, many ways. And, 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 and he would say the same. I made him better for some of the stuff I did. I did the same with Jimmy Sandlack. Um, he, he, we did some coaching together and I learned some stuff from him and, 
He said it. I learned I learned a ton of stuff from you. Mm-hmm. Like, right? No, that's important. So it's important. Sure. It's important. So that was a long answer. Yeah, I hope you like that one, Mark. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> got what you paid for there. <laughs> 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 well like how much do we gotta ramble <laughs> sorry guys did i leave anything out we right. did, I, don't, I think we hit every individual <laughs> word of the question <laughs> okay this is a fun one this is a fun one this is from our boy Bjorn. actually we didn't going back yeah yeah, yeah going said back facilities did you say something about facilities no or they don't that have was the, the previous question oh okay yeah yeah so we are done okay <laughs> <laughs> okay uh bjorn third question this is a fun one we'll do this one quick um maybe <laughs> Uh, what are your pet peeves? This is what he said. Nothing amuses me more than hearing someone's pet peeves. Probably because I find myself easily irritated with people and oftentimes I find myself annoyed with inanimate objects as well. I would love to hear a few of your pet peeves. These don't have to be hockey related. I find you guys hilarious and this would give me some more laughs. I'm sure you guys are the best. Keep up the outstanding work. Thank like you, Bjorn. An inanimate object would be like a cup. Yeah, yeah, the cup. So like, the just cup bugs them. off. I'm like, what? <laughs> That's um, funny. Do you want to go first for me? I'll go, I'll go. Here you go. Uh, pretty much everything is yeah. a pet peeve. <laughs> We're, you're one of those guys. I am one of those yeah. guys. And humans. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but but like off the top of my head, uh, people that chew loud. Yeah. No, they, they don't have mouth control. It's like <laughs> smacking and they don't <laughs> not realize that you're sitting beside them and they show their food and yeah. Uh, too much cologne or perfume. Like you, your stink is yeah. too much. Yeah. Um, loud mouths that know everything. <laughs> you love it, eh? Well, like, like, okay. So, for an example, <laughs> someone will come here and say, "So, uh, I've just got a question about hockey for like it could be anything." Yeah. But got a question for it. like I already know the answer. Yeah. yeah. Just, Tell like, me everything okay. you know. But then they do all the talking. Yeah. Bad breath. Oh. Like, get a toothbrush. Yeah. Like, it's okay. <laughs> Wash the teeth a little bit, man. And then, and then, and then, bad. The other <laughs> thing, I uh, it's a pet peeve is, or maybe it's worse than a pet peeve. Is space invaders that come yeah, talk too to you close, close. <laughs> and then combine that with some bad breath, man. Uh, time stealers, yeah. <laughs> People that you know, someone will stop. <laughs> you love it. What? What? Time stealers. That's a good one. Yeah, like they just I stop. Should, they stop I by. That one down. We're just stopping by here. See what you're up to, here, yeah. Andy. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I was just in the area. It's like okay. Yeah. Well, I'm doing the space invaders. I said pretenders. Yeah. You know what I mean by that? Yeah. Whiners, complainers, and people with a bunch of excuses. Knickknacks. That's your knacks, inanimate, yeah. inanimate object. Yeah. a knickknack. I was at someone's house one time, and there's more knickknacks, right? <laughs> and I was talking to these people, and I just kind of backed up a little bit, and I hit, like, it was a, uh, I don't know, a heater that was off the floor and stuff, yeah. and, like, 10 knickknacks fell off. I'm like, oh, be careful. Those are expensive. I'm like, well, come on, man. Like, how do I not, <laughs> not like, like, how do I not knock it over? Yeah. Phones when people are talking to you. Actually, one is huge is people that don't listen. Yeah. They ask a question, they cut you off, and you don't get your sentence in. It's yeah. like, yeah, okay, man. Like, yeah. Uh, I love this. People this are too fun. comfortable, too quick. Oh, I could yeah. go on forever. Too like comfortable. Humans. Too comfortable. Yeah. Eating white stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Anything that's white, no thank you, because you get it all over your lips, and it's gross. And then uh, <laughs> this is one of my biggest ones that actually relates to hockey. and and you want to get me annoyed is let me go watch a hockey and then talk to me. <laughs> talk to me during a trying game. Trying to watch the game, guys. Even my wife. Yeah, trying to go. Trying to I watch the game. I don't want your opinion. I don't want yeah. any conversation whatsoever. Trying the to only, watch the, the, the Very few people I like to watch a game with, and Phil Potras is one because yeah. we, we get each other. And uh, nothing's offside. Yeah. Like between right. us. It, during the game, there's yeah. some offsides. Yeah, yeah. It has to be. Uh, but don't talk to me during a game. I, 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 I just... I. At a hockey game when I'm watching, and I'm not even talking about my son, anything, yeah. is I love someone's opinion and the play-by-play. Like, just please give me more. <laughs> I just really want to know. I just want to watch. I just yeah. want to watch a hockey game. I think I inherited that from you. Yeah. I, but, but I you just want to watch the game. So just to not scare people off, though, you can come say hi if you want. Uh, yeah, you yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. 100%. Not during the play, though. Not during the play. Not Between during whistles the play. and I just want to watch a hockey game. Yeah. I and I you. want my own thoughts and... All that. So I think I think there's a lot of crossover. A lot of crossover here, which yeah. makes sense because yeah. we just get along oh so well. Yeah. Um, so these are the my general, more general ones. Uh, people who have 
strong opinions, but they're uninformed. Oh, I don't like that. Yeah, okay. that that's an obnoxious, just like yeah. lazy thinker. Yeah. I have a general, I generally tend towards the OCD side. So yeah. like lack of attention to detail. Yep. Yeah. Um, not to the extreme, but a little bit to the yeah. extreme, like straighten your shit up. Like, I don't know. I had that and I scratched neat. it out. Did you? Yeah. Because. Because it's I, not I, as bad as mine. <laughs> not as bad as yours. And, um, like my, my stall is like, as I change 15 times a day is a mess. Right. But I do not like clutter at yeah, yeah. all. Yeah. Yep. So that's, that's one for me. Uh, just lack of self-awareness or social awareness that kind of crosses yeah. over with you're too yeah. comfortable. Like if you're just, you walk in and you act like you own the place, yeah. just you, you bother me. Yeah. Um, excuse makers, complainers, like you said, people who dress sloppy, sloppy dresser. Okay. I don't like that. And, does um, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean. It doesn't mean you have to dress like you're going to your a funeral. funeral. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> this is why this works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it's just like, if you, if you're, even if you're just wearing ca- gym clothes, even just gym clothes. Okay. Right. It's like, look like you're doing a workout, yeah. right? It can be a ripped shirt. It's okay. But like, ma- like don't wear a gray shirt and gray shorts. Black you know? and blue. You know what I mean? Like there's just Navy certain. and black. And then if you're, if you're dressed up to like go, like have your shirt tucked in, like look like you're you just want to clean, look just at... be clean cut. Just yeah, be clean yeah. cut. All right. But even for me, like I wear cut off shirts when I work out yeah. sometimes. So it's not yeah. like the ripping or anything. It's yeah. just like bad coordination whatever just you don't look like because what if somebody comes in to talk to you and they look at you and they're just like what is wrong with you or your hair's out the, right i think your hair's fine you always say that but i think your hair's fine i don't comb it ever i know you don't but i think it's fine i think you judge me i don't judge you okay i don't i would tell you right um the guy who always talks like you said loudmouth guy when this is a hockey one when people are like over stereotypical hockey, like they use the terms oh, and all this shit. Dude, it's like put your hat on properly. Like I don't know. Like, like you can't just pass me that. You got to sauce yeah, it. Like, sauce oh. me the whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like beauty or everything's yeah. ew or like this, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah, terms. Yeah. Not yeah, for yeah, me. Yeah, love it. Uh, bad hygiene or being openly gross. Like if you <laughs> if you like just burp in front of people and yeah. stuff. It's like like you're gross. Yeah. Um. Yeah. What else? The loud chewer, like you said, the guy that humble brags. <laughs> I pick up on that. Yeah, I know you do. Like when you try to slip in a little yeah. plus for yourself, I'm yeah. all over it. Yeah. Um, people who load the dishwasher poorly. Oh, nice. That's a that's a unique one. Nice. If the dishwasher is a mess, yeah. that bothers me. Yeah. Just load it with some order so yeah. things fit. So I'm I'm the I'm the dishes guy at the house. Eh? Me too. My kitchen is yeah. like it's mine, mm-hmm. and. Uh, I don't like, we're beating this. To Whatever. Death. Yeah, it's fun. Uh, when I, I don't like when someone doesn't rinse their dish off first or clean it, scrape and rinse it. Mm-hmm. So I like, I have like a, in my head, I don't like washing dirty dishes. I like washing, like I want the dishes to be relatively clean before I wash them. Like, you know what I mean? Yep. So like if you put like, Give it a rinse. If you, let's say you have a big old spaghetti thing and there's sauce and shit in there. Give and all a of a sudden rinse. you throw it right in the, no. now you got, like, I agree. Doesn't make, yeah. Okay. Same. Thank you. Give it a rinse, guys. We're clean, guys. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. Right? I know. Give it a rinse. I know. Um, unanswered That's text. why the, the old girl likes to kiss me, right? Because I'm... Yeah, you're clean. You smell great. Clean. Yeah. It's great. Brush uh, my teeth. Unanswered texts drives me nuts. Inexcusable. Like, if I text you, <laughs> yeah. y- you need to answer me, please. I don't... That bothers me. Is there any exception <laughs> there to that? There are exceptions. Okay. Exceptions are... Like, how do... I don't know. How, how would I explain it? If If... You're in, if it's a person who you are frequently contacting, like you frequently text with, talk with, whatever, if someone found your number and sent you a text about something and you don't follow up, like personally for me, I would follow up, but I can understand not following up. If like that, if someone like they shouldn't be talking to you anyways, or they're asking you for a favor that's unwarranted or whatever, there's certain cases that I would call an exception. But if it's people that are like in your circle, answer the text like i don't know why you're not answering the text that's one for me um my last one is uh last minute plan changes that are due to poor planning oh i like that that's a big one for me so if there's something that's out of everyone's control and the plan has to change then i'm that one's fine but if it's because of stupidity that now everything's a scramble and we're rushing and whatever that that one bugs me so that's a list eh? being late yeah, that's right in line with that being late, right? Being being late is not not acceptable. I don't like that at all. 
So uh, those are mine. A long list, but that was fun though. I enjoyed. Oh, that. I got a list. Dude, I feel I, I could have kept going. This is just like off the top of like my head. We, if I did a podcast, like I don't think anybody would like me. Yeah, after my <laughs> podcast, if we did it on just pet peeves, on things that drove me nuts, to yeah. be like, I think my wife would even say, like, should we be married? <laughs> <laughs> but she knows she knows how I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Funny. The only saving grace that I have is I I know how to f- I know how to put on a game face. Like, yeah, you're a gamer. Yeah, and yeah. I it, it's sincere, but it's yeah. it's like I know how to talk to people and 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 not. Well, not always. My wife is my wife and kids have been telling me that my body language is very, very obvious. That's just getting old, though. But I, I feel like it depends on the situation because you're pretty good. Like, I feel like you toe the line very well. Yeah, I know. know, how, you know, how, you know I know. A, I think I know how to be a human. You know how to be a professional. I think so. You know how to be a professional. Yeah. It's one thing. Everyone's like this, though. Like how you are personally in your personal life versus yeah. when you're being professional. Yeah, it's like you, you get it. Yeah. Um. Okay. Next question from Corey. My 11-year-old son is currently in his second year playing in the squirts division uh, and his third year playing hockey overall. He plays as a defenseman and has made it onto the A team this year, a step up from last year's B1 team, which I don't know if that one, I don't know what B1 means, but um, where he had a strong performance and seemed confident in his abilities, possibly because he was comfortable with that level of competition. This season, now he's up a level. I've noticed some challenges in his play. From my perspective as a spectator, it seems like he's struggling with handling the puck more than usual, and sometimes he just doesn't seem to be clicking for him. I've tried talking to him about it, but I'm concerned that my choice of words might be more harmful than helpful. I'm wondering if getting him a new stick might boost his confidence. I just want to find a way to support him and help him get past this rough patch. Good question. From a technical st- standpoint, um, just simply continue to stick handle, but I'll get into that in a second. Um, don't say too much about it about how to do it or whatever. So that's like right now as a dad, I'm saying it as a dad. Um, one of the things that could be in his way a little bit is like things that you never look at or maybe don't look at or consider, I mean, is maybe he's just growing. Maybe not, but maybe he's just growing. Maybe that level of competition is that much different. Like if you take a kid that played – like we use this as an example all the time, right? Someone plays uh, their first round pick in the OHL or they go from the Ameri- OHL to the NHL, college to the NHL. The competition is just better. So all the little things you were able to do before are might not be as easy, right? So that's that's just something to consider. But I think the most important part, the most the best advice I can give to this is at the end of the at the end of the question, what's the what's his name again? Corey. Corey? At the end of your question, Corey, you said, could I get him a stick? And maybe that'll, mo- I don't know, motivate him. Boost his confidence. Boost his confidence. Yeah. Um, and it, that, that might because it's a new toy. Um, but the bottom line is if he continues to play around with the puck, and, you know, that's the question. Number one, does he do it enough? Or, or stick handling balls or anything like that. But for me, my answer to that would be – yeah, my answer to that would be the way that I raised my kid. And the way I raised my kid was I I I didn't tell him to ex- like to shoot pucks or anything like that. I just did it with him. Not not the hockey piece, but like remember I, I've said several times I'd take Charlie out in the back and let's we want to play catch. We'll play catch. We'll play playing catch for a couple hours a day or an hour a day. He got pretty good at throwing a ball, catching a ball, and just being an overall athlete. So if you're particularly looking at the hockey, I th- so I think one of the things to do is more of that kind of stuff. So you you, you, you get a lot of uh, lot out of that. Number one is you're spending time with your your son or daughter, right? You're, you're enjoying just doing a casual activity without being overbearing and telling them what to do. And they're becoming an overall athlete and they'll talk to you. You, you, you bring down, you would take down a lot of barriers for the hockey. If you want to do it for the hockey, instead of looking at, and you don't have to be a good hockey player to do this, but do it with them. So how do you do that? Like, I'm not very good at it or I'm the best at it or whatever. Well, this is what I would say is because he's 11, I think, or seven, seven, eight, nine, something like that. It doesn't matter. It actually doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Say. Doesn't squirt, matter. I don't know what squirt age is. Whatever squirt. Yeah, yeah is. whatever. That's about probably eight or ten. Um, 
11. Okay. So it, it doesn't actually matter. So grab a stick and ask, Hey, how do you, how do you go in the garage, go downstairs, go outside, whatever. Say, how do you do a tow dry? And the kid will probably say like this. And then if you're good, if you're good at it, he might go, wow, dad, you can do it. Or dad, you're horrible. Like, and then he starts showing you. So, well, let's, and, and just spend, it doesn't have to be hours. Spend 15 minutes saying, Hey, I'll have a competition with you on something. And it's good time together. Number two, he's working on it. And then you don't have to say you're sh- shitty at sh- stick handling. And then that probably encourages him to say, hey, dad, you want to have another competition and just get out there. So to yeah. me, that's a really good good way to do nice. it. Nice. My, my only add to that, well, I was first I was going to say about buying the stick just seems like a short-term fix. Like you're not root causing the issue. So it might boost it for a bit, but then like we're not addressing the problem. So you can do that if you want, but like that's not going to fix the issue to me. Um, right along with what you were saying, by, by doing those things, spending the time, you can figure out what he's focusing on when he's playing because he'll talk. You know, so instead of car ride home, what are you thinking when you're playing, son? It's like that's not the environment where they feel like they can be vulnerable, especially if they're upset with their game, et cetera. So if you do those things that you're talking about, spend the time, invest the time, do things just casual, messing around. You're not trying to correct. You're not trying to focus on hockey. It's like you can, the kid can show you how to do the toe drag, whatever, and then you can be horrible at it or good at it or whatever. And you can be like, oh, yeah, I remember you tried to do this last game or whatever. Um, what did you see when you did that? Or, or how come you, when do you decide to do that? Or like, when do you feel like you should use that move? Those, now you're talking and now the kid might say, well, if I see a guy that whatever, and now you can see what, what's the kid focusing on. And if maybe you, you'll be able to identify an issue in the thinking pattern, um, where now you can give them two or three things like, okay, let's try to focus on this and redirect the focus so you can find some confidence in being successful at those things in the game. That'd be one. And then the other, the other, other things like just to be honest is the kid might just not be up to the level of competition in which case to your point again it's just we have to practice you know so that's all i would add to uh, on that one um this from tyler what should the ideal off-season training plan look like how much ice time should you be seeing in the off-season as far as training program goes as far as a training program goes sorry um so ideal off-season sounds like on the ice oh so it's an on the ice thing or both or both i guess my answer was going to be both so do yeah. answer however you want. Like off season? Yeah, off season. Yeah, it all depends, and I don't like you know. I'm I'm getting more and more. Um, it depends. Yeah, I'm getting it depends yeah. for sure. It depends. It depends on your age. It depends on you know. We've talked about this before. It, it depends on a lot of things. Like if you were injured during the season and you missed six weeks of hockey, then maybe being on the ice would be a little bit more beneficial to you in the off season. If you've played a lot of hockey and you're you know, like a lot of hockey and you practice a lot, you know, it's might be a, less hockey might be more, uh, better. So less is more, I, which doesn't make sense. No, it makes sense. Um, so there's a lot of different things that go into that. And I'm less, um, I'm less, if, unless you're sitting down with me and you're asking my opinion about like, like, cause I don't like to give this as general advice. Uh, if you came in and said, for my summer plan, what do you think I will give you? Like me, Eric, if I came in? Yeah, or yeah. like if or, or if the per, uh, Tyler came in and said, what do I do with my son? And you really actually want my opinion. And I look at the age, look at what you're doing and all that stuff. Then I'll give you a, a, a specific, real yeah, specific yeah, yeah, answer. Yeah. But other than that, I, would, I, I don't like to give it because there's too many people that do too many things. And some people have success with it and some people don't. So, uh, but in general, d- general. Uh, off season, I would definitely spend time away from hockey when you're young and play other sports and, you know, touch hockey every now and then, or touch it near the end of the summer. I know a lot of people will say, yeah, but nowadays you have to be on the ice to keep up. I don't agree, but whatever. I've seen it too often. Um, when you're getting to a point where like, ex- for example, you're going into your draft year, I still think you need to, um, take some time off but your your on ice needs to be specific and then obviously getting from 14 15 and up you're also should be you also should be matching up your off ice with your on ice so like you have to take in consideration that you're doing x amount which is the most important thing is your off ice training and your on ice training has to be something that's not as like if your main focus is to be is conditioning 
in a, a certain part of your workout, then you don't want to be doing that again on the ice. So it's like there's technical and all that kind of stuff. So there's different things. I'm sorry for not giving you a real clear answer, but it's like everyone's different. And it really depends. It re- like really does depend. What's good for some people are not good for others, by the way. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to keep it general too. I think number one, like you said, you need time off. We're seeing that now like with the kids coming home for Christmas that are playing junior or whatever. All of them are like, I just need a break. Like I just need a break. Don't want to be skating. I don't want to be on the ice. I need a break. So I think that's important. Um, when you're young, I think, I think it doesn't really matter. If I'm being honest, like find things to work on that you need to work on, obviously. But in terms of what is the specific protocol you need, the younger you are, the less it matters. Um, have you heard the concept of majoring in the minors? I think people can be very guilty of that. Younger, even more. It's like, general things will work when you're young because you need to work on everything so you don't have to be so hyper focused on the detail because you don't have anything to sharpen yet you still need the base you're still working on the base so um don't get so caught up on details that you don't just go and do just go and do and whatever you think is useful when you're younger just go and do it try to be logical about it right you don't have to go and be random but generally speaking just do something as you get a little bit older, that's when I start to, th- I'm, I think that you need to actually have a plan now. It still doesn't need to be hyper specific, but have some kind of a frame. Like, what am I trying to do? What am I trying to work on? And you have to build it based on your deficiencies. Where am I lacking? What do I need to fix? In terms of off ice, on ice, <clears throat> just like you said, earlier in the off season, you're less ice. Later in the off season, towards the season, obviously you're more ice. And in the gym is the inverse. You start more in the gym and then less in the gym as you get closer to the season. But what you do during that time, there's no specific answer as you need to figure out what deficiencies you have. So my thing is I always like say, take, make, you know, take four week blocks, for example, say, okay, I'm going to focus on this next week. I'm going to focus on this. The next four weeks, I'm going to focus on this. And this is how I'm going to progress myself for the season and do it based on what you need to work on and you'll get better. It'll, it'll work. You know, once you're at the level of, high, high level junior, high, high level pro, that's when the hyper, hyper specific is now important. But before that, like you don't, you don't need to spend time worrying about all the little tiny details because you need the big things still. Yeah, exactly. And for for most, for most adults, they just need the big things still too. You know, if you're not a hyper elite athlete, general things will be your best bang for your buck still, you know? So especially when you have life, you have work, you have all these other things to do. So um, that's what I'd say yeah. about that. Well, and, and, and just an example off the top of my head, and I'm pretty sure I've got this right because I'm very good friends with uh, Matt Potras's dad, right? Good, really good friends. And we talk about a lot of stuff. And, you know, here's a kid that is uh, 19 years old, supposed to be in junior, but played in, he's playing in the NHL, just got sent to the Canadian junior team. And, uh, you know, what's the secret, right? So we we kind of laugh because – Look, we watch a lot. A lot of people go through the process of being trying to be a hockey player and doing everything right. And for him, I asked the dad. I said, "What, what, what did Maddie do?" And he goes, "I, I don't know." <laughs> That's an NHL player's dad. It's not like it's, we're nineteen seventy anymore either. It's like because everyone says you got to do this, you have to have that. And like, did he have a skills coach? Yes. He went to certain people at certain times. Did he play spring hockey all the time? No. Did he have a weightlifting program and stuff yes but like the dad doesn't even have a like not much of a clue uh because there wasn't much but what he did do a lot of is lacrosse and a lot of uh, like a lot of a lot of lacrosse and it's just a transferable skill set and i don't think he played lacrosse well this is the key thing he didn't play lacrosse for hockey yeah, he played lacrosse because he loved hockey yeah, right, right? And but the the skills that you learn lacrosse, like think about it, right? You're you're doing conditioning, you're doing agility, you're doing your stops and starts, you're you're getting hit, you're rolling off checks, you're making plays. You got to think. There's all these different things, right? So to me, you know, you're just going to be good enough or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mike says, my 11 year old worked on his shot a lot during the off season uh, when he's in the garage, and it was looking pretty strong. We were both excited to see the improvements when the season finally got going. His work has not translated to the ice at all this year. How do I handle this? A, what could it be? I know it could be a lot of things, but what should I look for? B, 
I don't want him to be discouraged from working on things off ice. Thanks. So kid worked on a shot, isn't seeing it in the game. How can you figure out the issue and then keep him from being discouraged? Yeah, so he's shooting off the ice. A lot of, a lot of people will say that, that uh, it doesn't translate, but it does. Um, not, being, not being dogmatic here. <laughs> yeah, very good word. Um, to me, like, it, and it, it depends on what your, um, what your, what's my word, man? It's not a hard word either. When you're watching, what's your perception of improvement is? Hmm. It's, yeah, I, that's I, a good I, point. I butchered it though. No, no, that's yeah, a good but point. Yeah, but what's what? What is your? How are you gauging the improvement? Yeah, how do you gauge the improvement in his shot? Because if it was like, like, it's like saying. You know, when they do studies on people that do fit fitness, like a lot of times you do a study and you read, well, we did uh, 20 people and they lost 10 pounds each in a short period of time. It's like you can't actually take that data, data, data or data. Yeah, I know. But because what are the subjects? So like if you take if you take those 20 people and they've never played a sport and they their, their uh, form of exercise is the TV clicker. And then you get them to walk and not eat chips for a month and and like in a controlled group and they've all lost 10 pounds. It's like, well, yeah, they moved. Right. Yeah, if I do that, I ain't losing if, 10 yeah, pounds. If I take you and I say, <laughs> yeah. okay, now we're going to do the same program and you're going to get, you know, whatever. It's like, it might negatively affect you. So when you look at my, the shot didn't improve and I'm not saying you're the kids, this boy shot, shit was, or shot was just shit, but what like so that's number one and and typically for me uh, in through my experience is that if you have like maybe it went from bad to not bad like improvement right so that's number one um i can pretty much guarantee that if you continue to shoot pucks you're gonna get a, a good shot now from a technical standpoint going on the ice it can be a little bit different and it could be a little different because maybe you're not a good skater, right? If you can't skate well, then that's it's it is hard to get a good shot. Or now, in getting more technical, now maybe it you're, it takes too long to load up. Maybe you're not bending. Maybe your balance is off. Maybe your puck placement when you're on the ice it's too far away for your body, and it changes everything, right? So I would say that most likely, yeah, that there's a skating balance issue Component, yeah that just doesn't translate and and i would say that if you become a better skater stick handler because everything kind of blends at some point your um your your shot will take will get better like just my thoughts yeah I'm, i wrote down the same thing like shooting in isolation at home is not the same as shooting under pressure in the game with all of the different things going on so right in line with what you're saying so do you need to identify the reason that it's is it he's not in good positions to get shots? Is it that his, I don't have to repeat what you said. You already said the same, same thing I'm going to say. So does the kid, at the end of the day, whatever that is, does the kid understand that, you know? So does the kid understand, okay, when I'm shooting at home, this is why it's good. When I'm shooting on the ice, am I recreating why this is good or am I not? If I'm not, why am I not? Is it because I'm not in the right spot? Is it because I'm not getting the puck close enough where I'm, I'm in balance, whatever? Is it a skating problem? Yada, yada. So that's where I would start is figure out why is it good at home, but is it why is it not good on the ice? Because the motion of doing it, the mechanics of doing it are very similar. It's not that well. It's right? it's totally similar, yeah. but like that's what I'm saying about where what is our starting point of what are we looking at as improvement? So if you're looking at just the puck, right, and you see, like say today we start shooting and you're just looking at the puck and you no form. And after a month, the the puck's coming out harder. It's like, oh, wow, it's a harder shot. But the kids, the puck starts way out here. and It's a huge scoop away from the body. And it's just they muscle it more. Maybe they just got stronger in a month, which is possible, right? It, the, the mechanics are horrible. Like, it's there could be an improvement in the shot, but the mechanics mechanics could be horrible. So. Yeah, yeah. That's uh. Now that someone's going to say, well, that's why you need shooting lessons. Well, no, not really, but. We're going to get to that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. We're going to get to All that. Right. Uh, number seven, this is from Conrad. What are some of the best exercises to improve my snapshot specifically? Should I focus on forearm exercises or is there a better way of doing this? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, 
it's a, one of the questions is, is depends on what you consider a snapshot. People have different versions of a snapshot, <laughs> right? So let's, let's say it's a, it's a quick release, right? Let's, let's say that. Uh, yeah, that, that's, I think that's the, yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely um, work the forearms, like for sure, grip strength forearms. So definitely like a um, lot, a lot of pulling motions and stuff like that. Um, one of the things that Dalton brought in front of us was the rice buckets, right? Strengthening those hands, like getting deep in the rice bucket and squeezing and twisting them out like it'll burn. A lot of uh, wrist curls and stuff like that. It, it really does help. It really does. But also shooting comes a lot from the hips and positioning of the puck. So when you're shooting, like this is the, this is the hard part of answering this question. You will always be... Uh, you, you'll have a better advantage of getting the puck off hard by having strength for sure. But if the mechanics are absolutely horrible, then the, your strength, like if you, if you put, if you're shooting a puck and you're not in balance. So like I have that sweet spot that I say shooting pucks from no matter what shot it is. If it's not in that sweet spot, then you're not in a, in a position to have strength and accuracy because you're off balance. So it's, it's as much of being strong and powerful because that's like, okay, so you think about it, right? If you take someone that's a little wiry little rat and they can rip a puck, that doesn't make sense if you're putting it against someone that's a 200-pounder and can't shoot a puck. It's like no. puck placement and technique. Yeah. So. My, so my thing, first of all, just when you shoot, even if you think it's coming off the wrist, it's always legs and core. Like That's it. So in general, like what will make your shot harder is just general strength, like you mentioned. So starting with that, building a foundation of strength is good. Building a foundation of rotational strength is good for shooting. Um, but still, all of that aside, you have to shoot pucks. So one, I, I had this conversation with somebody the other day, actually, and I was talking about this exact thing because they were asking me about forearms because everybody was all hyped about Connor Bedard's forearms when like he was at the World Juniors last year. There was like a big like internet virality like thing arms? he's just got no he's just got big forearms yeah, like just his forearms and he snaps yeah yeah popeye and he just snaps it off well and what i said to him was my grips are probably about as strong as they've ever been okay so like i'm doing jujitsu i'm grabbing i've never done more forearm work this is the most i've ever done so i'm probably about as strong with my forearms as i've ever been my shot sucks right now why because i don't shoot so if you, it's like, it's like doing weightlifting without taking that strength and applying it to the thing you need it for. So if you, if, if I do flat bench press all the time, as soon as I go to do an incline bench press, I'm going to struggle because I'm not used to that mo motion now. So if I'm doing all this forearm work, but I don't take that and go apply it to now the mechanics of the shot, that strength that I've gained, whatever, full body forearms, whatever you want it to be, is not going to go to the shot now. You still have to be shooting pucks the whole time. So make sure it, this stuff that we have given as advice is not in the absence of shooting pucks. Like the pucks, shooting pucks has to be first still. If you want to improve your snapshot, that's the best way. Getting stronger will help, provided you're still shooting a lot of pucks. Because I'm that's i the best example of it. My grips are as strong as they've ever been, and my shot is the worst that's ever been. Uh, except for when I was it's like simply nine. just because you're not shooting. Just because I'm not shooting, right? Yeah. So all that strength I have is awesome, but it's not, it hasn't made my shot better because I haven't been shooting, right? So that's one thing that you have to keep in mind. Uh, Craig asks, uh, what is your messaging strategy for shortening the bench? I coach U11 hockey, and in tight games, I'm finding it difficult to communicate the fact that some of the kids may not see the ice for the later stages of the game, maybe the last 10 minutes at, at most. So what's, uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well... My thoughts on that are like, uh, I don't want to have an opinion right now because it's a question that he's asking. So like, I, I don't, I, I, what a freaking mouthful. Yeah, what are you is. saying right now? Yeah, I know. It's a philosophy. So your philosophy, it's, that's what I'm saying is this coach has a philosophy and the philosophy, when you have a philosophy, when you're coaching, it's really important at the beginning of the year that your philosophy comes out, not midway through where it shocks mm. people. Do you know what I mean? Yep. So if your philosophy is right or wrong at 11 years old, you're going to shorten the bench because you want to win games. Right. So you can't like, that's what I mean. You can't suck and blow at the same time. Right. You can't, if you're telling people that this, it's a, 
de- we're, we're developing players like as a m- emphasis and then you shorten the bench then you're sending a bad message but nonetheless the your messages have to come out early in the season when you coach a team and it has to be clear and then if you forgot one of your philosophies uh, for example oh i shorten the bench when i when it when the games are tight the message needs to come out with the group even the parents at that point because there's confusion that this is one of my philosophies i didn't discuss so that there's no issues so cuz that gives people a chance to say well screw you i don't want to play here then or okay perfect right so i think a lot of this um I feel like a lot of the issues come from just not like, yeah, from just not getting the message out early. So if you have this message out early that, you know, I want you to hear it this, at this time of the day, this is what we wear at the rink. Practices have to be hard. This is the consequence of this, 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 and this. Oh, and by the way, our team, when we are uh, in the third period or whatever situations I play to win and your son may or may not be on the ice, then it negates. You can't really complain after if that's you've accepted. If that, if that's what you uh, chose to do, so I think the, that's the biggest problem. When you try to attack that mid season, or and then wonder why people are upset or butt hurt. That that's why. And then, um, yeah, I wrote the yeah. same thing down. Yeah. My Did you? first point has to be set up from day one. That's what I wrote. So day one, you got to lay it out. This is how things are going to go. If you haven't done that, now you're kind of chasing your tail a little bit to fix that problem but in maybe just to be a little maybe a little more practical maybe you did that and you still are finding it hard in game maybe it's reverting back to that philosophy that you've communicated it's like okay guys jimmy johnny and jack are are going tonight so those guys are getting the extra tonight for the last 10 or whatever you know and and the kids should know that because you've told them and and then the other thing is like sometimes you're going with your best guys to score or whatever, but for you 11, like particular to this question, it can't, I don't believe it can always be like your best player. Like if someone is having a good game, make sure they are included because then it's not turning into the last 10 minutes of every game. I know I'm not going to get a chance to play. Right. So if a kid is doing well, you throw the kid a bone, right? Throw in the last 10, make sure you're being, let's say fair because you're giving that kid what he deserves. He's having a good game. So make sure that kid gets to see the ice. And it's not just, these are the only three guys that play in the last 10 minutes at U 11. Like, I don't, I don't think personally for me, that's appropriate, but that is a philosophy thing. If you don't, yeah, agree, it's, it's a fine. philosophy, but like, yeah, yeah you, you, I, I think if you're playing like there's certain levels of hockey where it's probably not appropriate, but you know, that's something you ask the team. Like that's something you can ask your team. Like if you're playing house league hockey, do you guys want to yeah, show the bench or roll? Do, yeah, like yeah. it's a question, right? Mm-hmm. And if every kid says, no, we don't care, we just want to play it, then that's one thing. But if the kids actually care, then it's a decision that you have to make as a coach. But I think it's uh, uh, depends on the level. And you, yeah, you don't, yeah, it, I don't think every game, it depends on your philosophy. That's it. Yeah. That's all. Um, Renee asks at younger ages, how frequently should parents be approaching the coach? to discuss and check in about their kid for parents who don't know much about hockey. What types of questions or feedback should we ask or be looking for? Did you get that one? Yeah. Okay. I thought you're, Nope. That's all I got. You had more. So what do you think? Not much. Again, philo- your own philosophy, I guess. Like if you're someone that needs to know all the time, I guess that's one thing, but um, like, in youth hockey, like what? What's what's the question to ask? Like that's my biggest thing. Was what would you be asking about and checking in about? Like for if my kid's very young, it would be: is he behaving? Is he working hard? Is he listening? That's what it is. It's not no so much about how's his development. Then you could be asking a guy that wouldn't know the answer anyways. You know what I mean? So I I think your communication with your coaches at any level should be very. Um, uh, no, I don't want to say minimal, but it's like there's certain things to ask. It's like being a good kid, casual conversations. I think when you have conversations like we were asking this question, it's more as if, if there's a problem. Like if you're having an issue with 
you can see your kids misbehaving or your kids not getting ice time or, and I'm not saying go to your coach just because of that, but like the coach is being a complete idiot. Then I think it's maybe, Hey, w- what are you doing with our kid? This is whatever. But I think for the most part, you don't really talk to your coaches too much. Do you? Uh, maybe, maybe I'm, maybe I'm hearing it wrong or something. No, no. My, my thing is it just, it, I think it depends on your coach and it depends on your, right? Like, so if your coach is bothered by talking, then it's probably not a good idea to go try to talk to them all the time. Um, on the flip side, if you're someone who needs constant reassurance about whatever, then maybe you need that. So I think you have to find the balance of how does it work with your coach and what do you feel you need personally? There's not like a prescription. Like if you never have a conversation with your coach at all the whole year and you're good with that, then whatever. If you feel like you want to know, like, is my kid progressing? Is my kid doing well? Um, what do you see that they need to work on? Even if, I think even if you don't know, like you're not a hockey person and the coach isn't a hockey person, it's just like, I don't know, you're on the ice with them. Like, what? Do you, I don't know. Like, do you, do you have anything, any feedback on stuff you could work on or how he cares about getting better? He likes practicing at home. Like, you have nowhere else to go. Like, you don't have another resource, you know? So maybe you, maybe you, and if you do, maybe you can ask somebody else. But if their coach is the coach and that's the person with your kid, and on top of that, I think all those other things are important, like the behaviors, the the how are they interacting with their teammates, the younger they go, you know, as you're in like the mid youth ages, now it's like, now I think, again, depending on your coach and depending on what you need, that's where you should have like some more specific things about, okay, I noticed that they're the one that gets shortchanged all the time. What do they need to work on? And then maybe there's a que- uh, conversation to be had when there's an issue or when there's something that is bugging your kid or bugging you, then maybe that's a conversation. But I don't think like the weekly, hey, just checking in to see how things are going. Like, I don't think that's the thing. I think if anything, you you sh- should start to have your kid ask some of those questions if they need the check-in when they start to get those mid-youth ages. But but to me, the, the straightforward answer to this that's not that straightforward is you need to you need to balance what do you need how much communication do you need versus how much communication is your coach willing to give you because if you're if the coach loves to chat with the parents and you need constant communication you can talk to him every day if you want like te- you can text you can call you can have a meeting you can do whatever but if the coach hates meetings and doesn't want to talk to you and says leave me alone then that's not going to work and, and it might get, he hasn't given you much then it's yeah, probably right so i think it's just that drawing that balance right um Chris asks, have you ever had a particularly problematic kid on your team whose parents were blind to it? We're in U9 hockey, and a player is constantly trash-talking other kids, celebrating in their face, and overall has a bad attitude. We've tried speaking with the parents about it, but they see it as a non-issue. Yeah, I don't, I'm not saying I have exactly that, but there's there's the Jekyll and Hyde kids for sure. Mm. Um you know what that means? I do. <laughs> I wasn't good. expecting you to say that. That's good. Well, that's what came to my brain. Yeah, it, it happens. Like, I mean, there's a lot of parents that think their kids are the best kids ever. Maybe my kid's that kid. I don't know. Right? Um, but in, in this, so he's approached the parents and they, they said, nah, nah. yeah, I've seen that. I've seen that. No, it's not him. Now that now it's ringing bells of a couple guys. Yeah, it can't be. It's not him. It's, it's not like him. It's like, okay, but it is. So your options are you can keep arguing with the parents that it is and or or you could just deal with it in your dressing room, which you're allowed to do or in your in your domain, which is in the hockey thing or the dressing room, ice, whatever. What a marble mouth today. <laughs> um, but so when you're a coach goes back again, goes back to your philosophy. Right. And there's things that you tolerate, things that you don't. Right. It, like in respect is one uh, with other players and stuff. So. It doesn't have to be like if a kid's being a uh, kind of an idiot in the beginning of the year. It doesn't have to be like a major issue right away. It's just you're talking to your kid, that kid and you're saying, "Hey, that's doesn't go on here." Then you, if you feel like bringing that to the parents, and they say, "Well, that that's not what our kid does," you say, "Okay, okay fine." Then you you might even give the kid another chance or two. But it's like, okay, now you don't get to play. That's it. That's all. Like it's your domain. You don't have to explain it to mom and dad a, a, anymore because. Like, like quite honestly, there's several parents that will just not accept that their kid could be anything but perfect. And uh, they'll make more excuses than a pregnant nun for that person, right? So it's like, whatever. So your domain, 
and deal with it the way that you feel is appropriate. Like, and I'm fine with that. I, you know, like, and the thing is, is for me, if my kid was being, uh, I'd want him disciplined. I'd want him disciplined. If my kid was being that guy, I'd be happy about it. But there's some people that will just never admit it. Yeah. So I took, I took a little different angle on it. Yeah. Um, I was thinking of it more if they aren't the coach. Because the, oh. for, for some reason, my that's how I interpreted the question. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they are the coach. Oh, that's but interesting. Yeah. yeah. My interpretation of it was they're not the coach. So, you know, life is what eyes uh, you see it through. Right? Right? Yeah. It's all about that perspective. Yeah. So so to me, my answer is like pretty simple is you got to learn to eat shit, man. Like if you don't have the control, let's figure out how to work around the problem best we can. And sometimes the problem is just going to be there and you just got to deal with it. Right. So my, my answer is pretty straightforward for that. There's not really a you can't fix it. You tried, you tried talking to other parents about it, or you've tried maybe talking um, to your kid about it. That kid's tried talking to that kid, maybe you've exhausted all your avenues and the kid's just a pain in the ass and the coach doesn't do anything about it. And then it's like, okay, now what? Kid's still here. So now what are you going to do? You're going to cry. That doesn't help anything, you know? So that's kind of my interpretation there. Um, <clears throat> Josh, he asks, what are your thoughts on the concept of muscle memory? My son is six, which I know is young. And I do agree that the best way for them to learn uh, to shoot properly, sorry, not to shoot properly, the, fr the best way for them to learn to shoot is to simply shoot pucks. But my mind went to the idea of muscle memory and how it can be difficult to undo bad movement patterns after the fact. Can't learning to do it the wrong way be an issue? That's the question. Loaded again. <laughs> no, and, and of course they're loaded. It's a, it's, you don't see the kids or whatever. You got to just shoot pucks. Like when people say muscle memory, um, wh what does that mean? Like it's it's a term. I mean, if you do something once, if you do something, your muscles remember how to do it. But how wh how many times as a six year old or seven year old, if you're shooting pucks, like how much are you, how many are you really shooting? Right. This is the whole to thing. create yeah. muscle memory, right? Yeah. And then just being an athlete, like doing other things besides shooting like shooting a puck is not you're not you're not going to just do it one way from doing it shooting 500 pucks or a thousand pucks um your body's going to change you, you're going to get stronger um there's a, a lot of things that go into it it's it's not um the, the most important thing is that you shoot a ton a ton a ton of pucks you will get better at it if you ask questions and start picking it apart but i think it's just the most important thing is to um to shoot pucks like shoot pucks i mean that's the answer yeah i think m muscle memory is it's more of an issue when you're older so because here's a here's a term muscle memory is based on uh neuroplasticity which as you get older goes down that's just your ability to learn new things so when you're a kid like you have so much time to learn and relearn and unlearn and redo and all that because your your brain is still so plastic because it's developing that's what everyone always says until you're 25 everything's changing so all of those circuits you're building and rebuilding and changing constantly. So exactly to your point, how many pucks are you actually shooting? Are you shooting it enough pucks from six to seven and seven to eight and eight to 10 and 10 to 12, where that's an undoable bad habit. Like the, the purpose of shooting is to get the base of feeling how to shoot. That's the purpose. And then you can start to tweak it. So like the idea would be, you're not letting it go on long enough where they're just have horrible shooting habits. It's like, as soon as you see that they, can really shoot the puck which typically is until 12 or so like ray being able to raise the puck is not indicating that you're a good shooter like if they can shoot pretty hard they're older they're starting to get towards puberty this is when now we shouldn't we should be tweaking and working on it and being more focused on technique um in my opinion at least yeah well I, i'm just i was just thinking because i don't like the way i answered that so I was just thinking because sometimes it's just giving an example is just the best answer. So like going back to what you said earlier is majoring in the minors, right? Don't worry about screwing something up first. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Right? Start. Like yeah. when you throw a ball for your first year as a as someone, sometimes you throw like you don't have any body awareness and it's just a matter of throwing the ball over and over and over. You know, I, I always said that when my son played catch with me. He'd, every every catch, he'd try to turn the glove over, and I just spoke to him about on this side, cross this side, keep it open, whatever. And that took didn't do it in three, but he was able to change that. Getting to my point of using an example, this is a, this is actually good. I think you might like this. 
<laughs> is I started hockey. I started shooting more or less when I was two. It was not with hockey pucks, but whatever it was, I had my stick. And then I became three, four, or four years old where I played hockey and I was no good, but I played. And then I became a good player and I had the puck all the time and I scored a lot of goals. Was What was my shot? And I shot a lot of pucks. So what was my shot like at from shooting all those pucks at eight to 12 years old? Was it perfect mechanics? I probably doubt it, but I'm sure it got better from doing the thing. Okay. And I never took a shooting lesson in my life from anybody ever. And I got through my junior career and then became a teacher in hockey. And I shot, can't tell you how many pucks. When the blades, the sticks came out, they became, the Easton came out with the two piece. You put the blade in the bottom and, uh, so this is where when I was starting to teach, like I was in year two or something, the Easton's came out and kind of changed the flex of stuff like that. Didn't pay attention to it at all. Shot the same way. Had a Still had a great shot. Better than most. Then the one piece came out and it was the, uh, it was called Innovative. I think they were purchased by Warrior. And I could, I had a really quick release. You know the shot I'm talking about, release and come off quick. When I took a shot with this thing, my shot just went, I, I couldn't see the box. I went, what? So that was the first time in my life that I paid attention to the actual stick. Because we, I used to use lumber. So the flex was, you didn't have a 75 flex. It was a, here's your oak tree and play hockey. So that was the first time I ever paid attention to how the puck can come off my stick. So... I started realizing that if I can use the stick to my advantage, not just my power, so or and combining both, wonder what will happen to my shot. So I started keeping more contact with the puck. So like if I'd pull it in to shoot, I'd keep it on my blade and keep pressing down rather than pulling it in. My what I my point is what I did for thirty years, I changed in probably a month. So instead of bringing it in and like that snap, I'd bring it in and push down. To keep the contact. Yeah. So muscle memory, that's my point. I had the muscle memory to shoot and I, I tweaked it and it took a month. Not even, not even. Yeah, I just yeah. started being aware and of that it. that was as an adult. That, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So like if you say like you, you, you create bad habits, no, you can change them. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you, as long as you, as long as you do a lot of the good stuff. Yeah. More like a non-issue. Does younger. that make sense at all? I think so. Okay. It made sense to me. Okay. Um, Henry asked. Should a U13 AAA defenseman get any time playing forward? Would this be beneficial for learning the game in all respects? Is it early specialization to keep them on uh, defense all the time? Yes. I mean, to which? No, yes, it's, it's it should, good to play anything. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but you're, you're dealing with coaches and stuff like that. So if the question is, should he? Like I think that's the question. Should should we be making sure we do both? Well, that's how do you do that? Well, at that at that point, you're 13, and your coach is trying to win hockey games, and you're playing AAA. So I think lines are set up. I mean, if you get a chance to play up, go for it. Like it's not gonna, it's only gonna help you, or it's not gonna. If you have a bad game doing it, it's not gonna ruin your career or anything like that. So definitely, um, definitely play it. And is is it? It was a question like early specialization. Yeah, more is it important? early specialization if they just stick to D now forever no, at no. U13? No, that's fine. Yeah, because no, like I, fine. I you think can play, you got to know how to just play hockey. Yeah, I think like U13 is around the line where we talk about you're settling into your position now, where like there's exceptions, obviously, where guys change and whatever, like Charlie did around that time. Charlie but, was a D up until he was in Bantam. Right. So, so, um, I think that that should have been happening all up until this point, up, up until U13. They should have been all around. They should have gotten some experience playing everything already. I think now you're going to be fighting a losing battle doing that because now they should be kind of settling into a position at this point. Well, at the AAA but level. At the AAA level. Yeah. That's you can always go to your coach and say, hey, someone's, uh, someone's not – if a forward's not here, I can always jump up and yeah. get some experience. It'd be, it'd be very helpful. Yeah, that's for one thing but... I remember. Like for me playing, I actually I always played forward. I have no reason to think this, but I actually think I would have been a better defenseman than forward 
I think I could see the ice well. I think I could make good passes and, and whatever. So I think coming up from the back end, I would have been actually a better player, which might be wrong, but I never got a chance to play deep. I was forward right from day one. So I think it would have been useful or beneficial for me. And, and now I like playing D better. Um, but I was always a forward. So I didn't, I didn't know, like I was, I was a center. Everyone wants to be centerman. Everyone wants to score all the goals and whatever. But I actually think my skill set might've been better, uh, as a defenseman, but who knows, it would have been good to know, like to try it out when I was younger. It was my point. Yeah. You know? well, you just, I think you just, the most important thing is you know how to play hockey. Right. Yeah. Just, sure. Yeah. No, but I, I know that sounds like, yeah, no yeah. shit, but it's like actually you understand hockey. So yeah, you like have to if you, make if, decisions, you, you yeah. know, yeah. Like if you had to forecheck, would you have the ability to forecheck? Yeah, of course you would. Mm. So understanding angles, eh? And stuff like that. Um, okay, Kevin asked, I'm looking for advice on my son's U15 A team. They're winless so far this season. That's tough. Uh, and to say the coaches didn't try or care at all is an understatement. I'm on the coaches did not try. Didn't try or yeah. care. Uh, I'm on our board, and we've moved to have them dismissed from the team. And in the interim, I'll be helping out. I have no illusions about turning them into a winning team, but some teaching on the defensive side would definitely help. I know it depends on the players, but what are some defensive systems that might be helpful? We have two very good goaltenders that we can heavily rely on to make the first save. So defensive. Well, let's just do like, I don't know. Well, you answer it however you want. I, th- I was going to do like general thoughts on defensive play first and then maybe like systems. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's, so it sounds like you don't have um, like high-end hockey players. Obviously, if you're losing every game, coach didn't take any time to teach you anything and so like for me it'd be really simple is um the offensive zone you would want to you want to forecheck hard but you don't want to get three guys deep so i would like probably go two guys deep with a really good f3 to take care of the middle of the ice right and back pressure through the middle so that they can't make plays through the middle, keep guys to the outside. And then I would go back to our defensive system. Just look at that again um, of uh, yeah, the, the, podcast the, the that quadrants. We did. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. having your center work hard, your D, you know, just working those quadrants. And I, I think that's your best bet. Just that's it. Have a little bit of patience, work hard in your D zone. Mine was the same. Just And then neutral zone, same thing. Don't single chase box. Like learn how to do a like a one, two, two. Like, yeah. I, feel, I, I was going to say, like, it's U15, so they should be able to grasp concepts to a certain degree. So I would say if they need whatever the zone is, they have to learn, like, the concept of zone play and not just following guys around or man on man. Like, they need to know their quadrants in the D zone or ne- neutral zone or off. So whatever zone it is, it doesn't matter as long as they can figure out how to play their zone. It really doesn't matter what system you use as long as it's kind of that, and that'll give them some structure. Uh, last one. This is a fun one. Sam asked, if you never played hockey, what's another skill set? This could be a sport or activity, whatever, that would be of interest to you. Have you ever tried it in real life up to this point? Asking us yeah. if we didn't play hockey. Didn't play hockey. What, what's something else you would have been interested in pursuing? Um, oh, sport, activity, skill set of some sort. Some that, well, I love playing racket sports, so that would be one. If I could do life over again, I would do definitely spend time in track. Yeah. It's it's really good. I underappreciated how important that was. I would I would even for people that are looking at getting in shape for hockey. I would honestly, the more I know about it, the more I'd say go spend time with a sprint coach or uh, speed coaches. The speed doesn't have to be running; it could be lifting, right? So I, I I would say that. And then my other sport that I would love to do is I would love to do. I not that I. No, I'd be very interested in doing it, but I know I don't have it in me to be an MMA guy. I'm not that no, 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 but I, I, I would love that sport. Um, rocket sports, yeah, that's that's cool. about it. Um, you? Yeah, like answering other sports is easy because I like sports. Um, so whatever, same kind of thing. Any other sport really would have been interesting to me. I don't have a particular one. I wouldn't say racket sports for me, but now that I do jiu-jitsu, that's cool. So I would like that maybe when I was younger to do more like combat sports. You know, I did boxing when I was younger, but I like gra- like the grappling stuff. I think I like it more. Maybe I would do that. Um, I really like playing volleyball, which I don't know if I would pursue it, but I like playing it. It's super fun. Uh, but then if I go outside of sports, I would have been music for sure. Just because just my family. I would have I would have been interested yeah, to see been, yeah. like 
what kind of skill set I could have developed given my, like if I would have tried to be like my dad and like went into music right off the hop, like how, how good could I have been at guitar or singing or like performing in a band or that kind of thing, which would be cool. So that would be one for sure. And then the other would have been um, like some type of a design engineer would be cool where I don't even have a specific product, but like being a person that comes up with the new design of a vehicle, the body of a vehicle, or with a new design of a shoe or a new design of a certain kind of product. I don't even have like a specific one in mind, but that process, just because I did some of that in school is pretty cool when you actually develop the layers of it and how it's going to fit together yeah, and that kind, of stuff, that kind of stuff's cool. So that's the other, that's the other one I wrote down too, is like a tr- some kind of trade. And I'm, I'm just, I don't know why I'm, I'm interested in, building stuff look like at looking back flooring, at life flooring guy yeah you know looking back at life like i i would love i thought we were just talking about sports no no anything oh, anything. so other than that yeah 100 percent. i would love to uh yeah if i could go back in life my spare time i would i would hang around with someone that fixed things whether it was yeah. cars or right, anything. yeah just, for sure for like sure. it was cool i think i think i read an article of arbor jack guy that uh he, he in back home in Hamilton, he's got some buddies, and they that's what they do. They hang out in a garage, mm. and they they love cars and they fix cars and they build cars. Cool. That's a really cool uh, yeah uh, hobby to have any, or any interest. That, yeah, any of that like tinkering yeah. yeah type stuff. Yeah, where you're building yeah. whatever like, but even like all the construction work, like framing, doing any of that, yeah. putting in ventilation, putting in whatever I, I like all that stuff i think it's yeah, I, I have like a natural interest in it like just knowing how it works and then i feel like an idiot that i don't, I don't know how to do any of it but yeah um that's that's, but it is cool. that's actually a regret i say what i would have yeah 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 cool cooking's cool too yeah love cooking, cooking too yeah i'm actually okay at cooking so i, I love it that. i count that as i, I love doing that. dishes too do you love doing dishes do i love doing dishes love doing dishes Really? Oh, Calms yeah, me true. down, man. That's your version of cutting the grass. Hot, hot hey? water. My wife puts her hands in. She yells. She goes, well, it's too hot. Yeah, I don't know yeah, how you just do go that. mind I, your own business. I was complaining about the shower water today because it's way too hot. Yeah. But anyways. Okay, cool. That's everything. Um, So these were the member questions. So if you want to be on the next one, be a member. And then you can. Cool. Anything else to say? No, all good. Okay. Happy Merry New Christmas. Year. Happy New Year and all that shit. Merry Christmas first. Well, this is going to be out after Christmas. So happy New Year. Well, it'll be, happy it'll be belated, the 31st. Belated for this comes out the 31st. That's all. Oh. Belated so, Christmas. Happy belated Christmas. I'm not, I'm not wrong. Cheers. Cheers. Okay. Goodbye.